Hey everyone, before this video starts, I wanted to let you know on July 10th, on Saturday from 10 to 6 in San Francisco Sunset District, there's going to be a Fisherman's Life Street Fair, basically renting out the entire block. We're going to have different vendors, boats for sale, there'll be food, music, everyone is invited. So July 10th, mark it off on your calendar if you can. Daniel will be there, my friend Andrew will be there, Nick. Adam, Taku, Ish, a bunch of other guys are going to try to be there also. Fisherman's Life Street Fair, that's going down, so please come out if you can. Now enjoy this video, I think it's a really good one. And yeah, thank you for watching, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Oh man, it's been so long. Out here with Kevin from Catch and Cook California, that's his YouTube channel. He hasn't posted a video in over a year, I think, right? Is it over I a year? I think so. I think last time you and I fished was two years ago, probably going for lobster yeah. diving. That video is out. Man, you've just been on a long hiatus, dude. Yeah, it's tell, been a while. Yeah, tell us what you've been up to. So, I've, I've been like, my head's been in the books for like a year. I thought I was gonna finish my PhD, my dissertation like a year ago. Yeah. And uh, it turns out, that the reason that most of us don't know a lot of doctors is because getting your doctorate is really difficult. And uh, so yeah, I've been I've been writing my dissertation, and I'm finally at like that that point where all I've got is edits. Yeah. So I think I should have it in the bag in in a couple months. It's been so long. So we got a really fun day today. Plan is not only to catch some eels or rockfish, but I hit up Kevin because. He is so knowledgeable in all things foraging. So I want to learn how to pick the right seaweed to eat. We're going to go away from the beach after this. We're going to go up to the hills and forage for some wild uh, plants. What else? Yeah, yeah, we'll just walk and do a little ethnobotany. So like uh, cultural uses of plants. And then at the end of the day, we're going to combine everything we get and make a hopefully delicious meal. So the good thing about right now is that it's not even low tide yet. So the tide is going out for another 40 minutes and then it's going to stay down there for about 40 minutes and then it's going to come up very slowly in about two hours. So we have a lot of fishing time today. You come out poke pulling, you want to get out here before the low tide peak. All right, let's get out there and start fishing. So it looks very shallow over here and every once in a while you'll see a couple rocks put together like that which might have a little eel in the crevice and it doesn't take much standing water for these eels to be staying down there so just putting it right at the tip of the hole and if that bait starts to move around you know that there's a bite so I've covered this quite extensively in my recent videos I think you guys know the drill let's just focus on catching the fish then we're gonna start foraging <laughs> Maybe not a snag. <laughs> Bro! Oh well, that my was quick. gosh, you knew exactly where to go. <laughs> That's the okay. benefit of coming out here and knowing the spots. Look at this. Dude, Holy I totally cow. That was a snag. And I'm like, maybe it's a crab. No, that's not a crab. <laughs> that's a nice size eel. Okay, make sure he's hooked. I'll go grab that sack first. Yeah, I'm gonna cut his gills. Man, that's so crazy. Just like that, right off the bat. Kevin with a huge eel. Good job, bro. <laughs> that was about two minutes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you already know what the plan is for today's video. We're foraging, catching fish, trying to cook up a meal. Part one is basically done. Now I could fish, but you guys seen me catch eels and stuff. We might fish a little bit later, but Kevin just caught this huge eel in about two minutes. Monkey face prickleback is not actually an eel, it's a fin fish, and yep. through natural selection, it's developed eel-like morphology. These things are one of my favorite fish um, because they're so weird and unique. They're predominantly vegetarian, um, but Kirk Lombard's got this whole thing about them. Like, uh, like some vegetarians, if you dangle a cheeseburger right in front of their face, they're going to take a bite. And uh, in this case, cheeseburgers are, are squid, which is our preferred bait. Uh, the other thing is the poke pole. Uh, so I'm an archaeologist and I have uh, an emphasis in traditional technologies, what, what some people refer to as primitive technologies. Um, and you know, one day I was looking through some old ethnographic accounts and I found one in, from Southern California among some Shumash folks that talked about a woman in Gaviota area who used to go down and fish with a shellfish hook. So the fish hooks back 
back then, um, right before European contact to right after European contact were carved out of shell, out of mussel shell and abalone shell. And she used to go down there with a shellfish hook, a long pole and a short line and catch fish. And I, I was reading this and I'm like, that's, that's a poke pole. So this method that we're using is actually an old Native American fishing technique, which I think is super, super cool. And it works really well. And I, what, I think, what I've been saying in my last couple videos is that, wow, look at that thing. Whoa! <laughs> Be careful of your foot. <laughs> look at that eel still moving around. His gills are cut. He's been bonked and he's still trying to escape. So you always got to keep a stringer or something on him. I mean, look at that. He's, he's dead. I even severed his spine. The fact that he's still moving. It's almost like a snake, you know, like you can cut a snake into small pieces and they'll still move around. Yep. It's just, uh, it's crazy. So I think we're going to do some foraging now. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. You asked about what I was doing to catch this thing. We've got an undercut here. You can see you actually don't want to put your bait right on the edge. You want to get, way down underneath there because that's where the eel's hanging out. Now this particular hole, I don't really like it because there's a lot of water flowing back and forth under there. To me that, that means that an eel that would be in there would be having to work a lot to stay in that spot. So it's not gonna be there. So I tried it anyway, just in case, didn't catch anything. And then I found a hole right over here where the water's not flowing, but it's real deep under that rock. And bam, I thought I got snagged. <laughs> Yeah, so man, a couple times I, I'm walking on the jetty and I've come across people and it's been slippery out there and, and their knees are all scraped up and they've fallen like three or four times bloodied and bruised. I've been teaching some people like kind of getting new, new folks into it because I feel like poke pulling is like really an approachable way for people to learn how to, to fish. Yeah. But that's one of those things I'm always emphasizing is like, you know, people, we're all used to walking around on two legs. We're bipedal. That's what we do. Yeah. And yet you come to the inner title, I'll always warn people, like, try to use three points of contact, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think a lot of people ignore that, and then they slip and fall, and they realize, like, why? You know, I'm doing this all the time. Yeah. But if you look at this seaweed, this seaweed right here, tons of, tons of traction. I could step on this all day, and I could walk around on this all day, and I'm completely comfortable because I know what seaweeds are super slippery. But if you were to come across these shiny ones, you know, or these shiny ones, those you'll just slip and fall and you'll bust a knee. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Little abalone shell. Yep. Some other things you could find out here. Little abalone shell. It's a nice one. So I wrote my master's thesis on those abalone shell fish hooks I was talking about. I'm gonna make us two of these, two fish hooks out of this with all stone tools. We'll do it, we'll film it. And then we go stone tools. Uh, poke point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do we, how, do, how do we get the line? Are we going to use mono? Nah. We'll, we'll no. use some plant fibers or something oh, like that. Sweet. We're going to do it all old all school. All natural. Yeah. It'll be fun. So we're walking to find some seaweed and stuff, but there's just so many potential spots here. Got to stop and give it a try. I mean, especially when it's a deep hole like this that goes under for a foot. And like Kevin was saying, it's calm water that's pretty stagnant chances are there could be an eel in here and we might as well I mean we're out here we're out here anyway look at how he's moving too so stealthy so stealthy for the eels and he got a rockfish right on cue a little grassy. very common out here you want a big crab you want to cook a crab with our with our meal? Whoa. Some nice claws on them. Let's do it, dude. Yeah, might as well. Just saw his big old claws sticking up. Got a nice rock crab with a couple fat claws. We're gonna throw that in the sack. Into the bag she goes. He goes, I should say. Now we're gonna make this video all about foraging, okay? all about what you're gonna see out here. There's a lot of people who have never had the chance to come out to the ocean coast and experience these low tides. So this is some of the stuff that you're gonna see out here and we haven't even been out here long. All right, well, we can't let Kevin catch all the fish. I mean, we could, but we gotta to try to catch something on our own too. Besides a crab.
you gonna buy it? A uh, good eel or like a yellow greenish fish came out of here. Oh my god, what is this? Look at this thing, watch this, Kevin. Oh my gosh, is that a crab or a... Oh, <laughs> oh man, dude, bro. Yes. Oh, oh, he came off. Stay up here, stay up here. Oh, look at that thing. <laughs> look at that yield. Oh man, he's not going anywhere on this flat rock. <laughs> look at that. We got one eel. I'm going to keep this one and bring him home, but I'm going to keep him alive too because they, they're so hardy. Nice catch, dude. Thanks, man. <laughs> that was the same hole. That was the same hole you got your rockfish in. I mean, just goes to show. Keep poking that hole. Once you get one fish, doesn't mean that that's all there is. He's probably 24. He's probably 24. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Look at this thing on its head. You guys see this thing? It's kind of like a chicken. Look at the thing. It's just all fat, cartilage. Oh wow, he's got some chompers on him too. Ooh, sharp teeth. See those? And it looks kind of cruel because he's trying to breathe, but these species have evolved to stay out of the water at low tides like this for hours upon hours. So he's completely fine. What a beautiful fish. Kinda, in its own way. Look, look at this. We just, Kevin just found this little hole and it's against a rock right here that I'm standing on. All right, there's two weights, three weights, four weights, five weights, <laughs> six weights, all in this little hole, seven. He's still picking it. Eight, what the heck? Nine. Look, this guy, he must have been a, he must have had a horrible day. <laughs> he, you know, he gave up fishing after this. There's another one in there, but it's wedged. Ten weights. There you go. <laughs> That's another thing you could find out here. Wow. <laughs> dude, dude, check this out. Uh, what do you got here? Like a giant rock crab eating an eel? Eating an eel? I think that's what's going on. Yeah, dude. What? Look. That's a nice red rock crab, dude. Let's let's eat him. I mean, the eels are friend. We got to protect him. <laughs> I think eel-fed rock crab would taste delicious. <laughs> oh, dude. It's a big one. Big male, too. Yeah, that's going to be great. You messed with the wrong eel, buddy. <laughs> Look, he's eating this old dead eel. I wonder what happened to that eel. So we changed spots completely and now we're doing something that I've never done on this channel and that's because I have no idea what I'm talking about if I were to do it. So that's why Kevin is out here today. He's going to explain to us what we can eat as far as seaweeds go, what we should not eat as far as seaweeds go, and maybe a little bit of how to prepare it, but also most importantly how to identify it. So let's yeah. get started on it. This is the first, one of the first ones that we see out here, and what is this one, Kevin? This is a feather boa kelp, because um, it looks like a feather boa. It's got these cool little air bladders on it. Taku said that he dried some, uh, Outdoor Chef Life, he dried some and he said uh, the flavor was really good, and that he thought it would make a really nice uh, stock. So technically I think it is edible, um, so I guess it might be worth trying to make a stock out of Shout out to Outdoor Chef Life. What is, what's it called again? This is feather boa kelp. So that's the first one you might not want to keep. Now let's go to something that is amazing. Yes. This one here, this is wakame. Um, wakame is my all-time favorite. It's a really delicious seaweed. If you harvest it, I usually harvest and then dry my seaweed and then I'll rehydrate it to use it for no a number of dishes. Like today we're going to use this to make a seaweed salad. But what's interesting is when you dry it and rehydrate it, it turns green, like a beautiful green color. Keep in mind, whenever you're harvesting any species of, of seaweed or kelps, marine macroalgaes as they are, is you want to cut them above their reproductive organs or, or the, the, the hold fasts, these points here that anchor to the rocks. If you would cut them up here, then they can reproduce. Uh, if you just pull them, then that's it, they're done. And that's a totally unsustainable way to harvest. We want to be able to do this for generations, just like it's been done for generations, and so we want to do this intelligently. So we just, there you go. So it's called wakame, and your preferred method is to dry it, 
and then rehydrate it and yep. then put it in the stock or what would you do with it? This one's good for seaweed salad. Seaweed salad, okay. Yeah. Can you eat it raw? Totally. So I could, yeah. I could try a piece. Go for it. <laughs> it does, what, what's the best part? Middle, the end, I mean, the piece with the bigger leaf? Yeah, I would take a piece out of here, but keep in mind you're going to want to rinse it in one of these tide pools too because all this stuff's been laying on the on the ground and so you know, you'll know you get sand and stuff in there and you don't want to like, here, right. let's just cut yeah, it. That's pretty, I got a little piece. I just want a little yeah. piece. Okay. So you think rinse it in the yeah. salt water? It's that way it tastes nice like tide pool. And it changes the texture after you dehydrate it and rehydrate it? Yeah, I think and you, so. You'd put it in a salad rehydrated, kind of just wet? Yeah. And does it change, change the flavor too? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Like the, the texture of it when I hold it is like rubber. Yeah. When I chew it, it's like rubber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of these smaller ones will be a little bit more But it has a nice flavor. Tender. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's jam packed full of nutrients. Ooh. They're full of like uh, vitamins, they're full of minerals. Cool. It's good stuff, man. Just one bite and I feel the nutrients spreading through my body. Yes! <laughs> I have become the seaweed. <laughs> so Kevin has already harvested some of this wakame the other day, but personally, I'm gonna cut some, take some home and try a few things with it. Get it ready for the next video. So I'm just gonna cut it right above that reproductive organ. All right, so now this is the kombu, right? Yep, this guy right here. See how it's got the branches? Yeah. That, that's a very identifiable feature of, okay. of uh, kombu. Okay. And when you harvest it, this species you want to cut above where it forks. Ah. So again, any of these where you're pulling the actual stipe, yeah. you're, you're destroying that, that uh, okay. piece's ability to rejuvenate. I can't help but think that the reason this particular area has so much abundance in seaweed, it's not the case in all of the coves you know, up and down the, the coast, is because of the presence of these sea stars. So, you know, if you're not familiar with what's going on here in California and, and really up the coast, even further north in Oregon, um, and I think Washington and Alaska are also experiencing it, there's a, a die-off of sea stars um, from a, a disease called sea star withering syndrome. And uh, essentially what's happening is uh, these sea stars get infected by this disease, they die and while that might not seem like it would make a big, uh, a big impact to the environment, sea stars, especially certain species like the large sun stars, are the main predator of purple sea urchin. And I know a lot of you have probably heard about this, but for those who haven't, purple sea urchin, uh, they breed like crazy and they can, they can actually reproduce under starvation conditions. And purple sea urchin eat seaweed. Now, why is that a big deal? If you have no sea stars to control the purple sea urchin population, the sea urchin population explodes, they eat all the seaweed, and that then starves out the abalone. And so I grew up abalone diving. I've been diving for abalone since I was like 11 years old. So I don't know, it's over 26 years. Um, and now we can't go for abalone. It's not from over harvest or anything like that. It's because of this crazy situation with the sea star die off. So. Hopefully that'll change soon, but I had to talk about it because there's a tremendous amount of sea stars here and there's a tremendous amount of seaweed and I, I can't help but think there's a correlation there. But it looks promising because when I walk around, it's not only the big ones, there's tons of small ones too. So these are the babies. Could be. And they're growing up. Could be. We'll see. <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying this video so far. I hope it's not too much like going to school. I know there's a lot of information in it, but right now we're just picking some mussels and you know, there's a lot of new people who watch the video. So right now I'm getting the smaller size ones. And today is the last day where you can get these before they go into quarantine. And if you eat them when they are in quarantine, you have a risk of dying. Kevin was telling me about a story of some people on a cruise ship who went to Alaska and they got off at some island or something and they picked a bunch of mussels. And then what happened to them? Yeah, they, so, I guess the Coast Guard eventually finds this cruise ship or whatever it is and uh, they had just, they had harvested clams I believe it was and everybody ate it including the captain and the crew and they just found this boat floating around with everybody dead after like multiple days. So I mean the worst case scenario is you, you get, die. you die, that's a pretty bad scenario. And then an intermediate scenario is you get amnesia and you completely lose your memory, another intermediate scenario is you get paralysis and you can no longer move 
And the best case scenario if you get poisoned is you just poop your brains out. And I think if the best case scenario is you're pooping your brains out, it's probably not a good idea. Yeah, and uh, people are out here pretty often checking the levels of these things. So would you say that the quarantine is relatively accurate? I think so. I think, you know, if you ever have questions, just call the Biotoxin Information yeah, Hotline. Exactly. It's 800-553-4133. Uh, yes, I do have it in my brain. This is thimbleberry. Thimbleberry. So as we head up to forage these edible plants, Kevin is talking about basically all these plants and what their benefits are and what you should avoid and stuff. We're not going to keep it on this channel. Just going to keep it on his channel. So if you want to check it out and learn more about the plants from Kevin, Catch and Cook California. Otherwise, we're going to get to the plants so we can get to the cooking. Piece of miner's lettuce just so you can see it. And that's, we can eat it just like this. Now we're out here in the, the wild cabbage patch. There's a really cool little riparian forest right along this little creek. Everything's emerald green and beautiful. And we're going to grab our last little ingredients. So we got two invasive species here. Uh, this one is a nasturtium. It's got an edible leaf and an edible flower. I just picked one of these. You can see that flower is just gorgeous, vibrant orange. And it tastes like a radish. It's super spicy. Yeah. And then uh, this one is the wild three-cornered leek. Um, it is non-native, like I said. Um, the flowering stalk has a triangular cross section, and that's one of the ways to tell it. So three corners, three-cornered leek. It smells very potent, like a onion or garlic, something like that in the alum family. And uh, they're totally delicious. Another distinct feature is they have these green stripes inside the, uh, each blossom. Um, and then yeah, we're gonna cut up some of the greens, we're gonna cut up the base and then use them in our, in our delicious foraged meal. We have this big old eel. Next to it, we have another eel. Now this one has changed colors to white. So what I'm gonna do is skin the dead one, get all that skin off, get the meat off. They have no rib bones, so it should make filleting easy. I'm gonna show you, super simple to clean these guys. Cut the skin, peel it off, we'll do that right now. So I'm gonna take my very sharp knife and them score along the back, all the way along the spine, all the way to the tail. Helps a lot if you have a sharp knife and you don't want to go too deep, just score in the skin. This is really, really good meat. So we're going to just flay this like a normal fish. It does not have any ribs, so we're going to stay close to that spine. Get all this meat off, try to waste as little as possible. Right, there's our piece of meat. That's one piece of meat from that monkey face eel. And in all my years, I've actually never seen a parasite in a monkey face eel. So it might be one of the cleaner eating fishes. And its main diet is wakame and that other seaweed. So we're gonna do the same thing here, get the skin off this side. Then we're gonna have a lot of meat. I can chunk that up real fast. This is probably one of the most important parts. When you cut this corner off, you wanna get it as close to the skin as possible. Cause if when you start to get the meat, then the meat starts to peel. So get it as close to the skin as possible. Get a good firm grip on your pliers. Hold the head. It should all rip off. Nice and clean. Just like that. Two fat pieces of eel meat. Basically rockfish. And now I'm going to chop them up super thin. Next thing I'm going to do is take these two eggs, crack them, put them in this plastic bag because we're going to do an egg bath first with this meat. Two eggs in here, we're just going to mix them up, just mix that yolk into the white. These Ziplocs are amazing when you don't have bowls, you can just throw anything you want in there. Just going to dump this whole pot full of fish into the egg wash, mix it around, make sure all the sides get coated with a little bit of egg. And that's what's gonna make the pork rinds stick to it. So I've got these pork rinds in this, and this is the equivalent of panko flakes. This is the equivalent of a bread coating, except this meal has no carbs. Zero carbs, basically. And some people want that, so. Oh, that's what I forgot to do. I forgot to add a little seasoning to the fish, but it's not too late. We got salt, pepper, and garlic. Mmm, smells great. I'm just dump a little bit in here. Should be more than enough. That's one eel. 
that's a lot of meat from one eel. Every little piece that I put out, I'm just gonna let it drip a little bit of the egg off, and then I'm gonna dump it in here. And I'm just gonna do that with everything right now. So everything's gonna have a little bit of an egg coating, and once I mix it up in here, everything's gonna be nicely covered with the pork rinds, and then we can start frying. Doesn't that look just like panko flakes? Breadcrumbs? Now while I finish up putting the meat in this bag, I'm gonna get my oil heated. We're gonna deep fry it, so we got some vegetable oil here. I also brought this grate. I'm a little bit more prepared today. So I got these uh, napkins under here. I'm gonna just lay this down. So once the fish is cooked, take it out of here, I'll put it on here. It'll drain the excess oil and it'll give it a nice place where the air stays under it so it stays crispy or it's not just sitting on the bottom getting soggy. I think that piece is done. Take a look at that. It looks good, yeah? Looks good to me. So we grabbed some of this uh, rosemary. So I'm just melting some butter, infusing it with the rosemary. That's gonna be one dipping sauce. And we got this wild three-corner leek uh, pesto. So that'll be your other dipping sauce. This is wakame seaweed salad with a Asian salad dressing. And then we've got sort of balsamic vinaigrette over the miner's lettuce uh, salad as well. These guys right here are almost cooked and that's going with our final batch of pork rind eel. For our drink, Kevin's got this wild harvested tea, chamomile. It's got yerba buena, chamomile, thimbleberry leaf, and wild strawberry leaf with a little bit of pine needle. It smells sweet. It smells really good. Yeah. And this is the finished product of our meal. That's a hard day's work right there. Okay. I'm going to have a little bit of this tea first, actually. It's nice. The, yeah. pi the pine stands out. Right, I want you to try these pork rind eels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. All right. I think I got to try one without any sauce, right? Yeah. Let's do it. Dude, that's hella good. It's really good, right? That's super good. Nice crunch, too. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. It's got kind of like a bacon thing going on. Like yeah. Smoky. It's It's got like a fried chicken thing going on, too, to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Dude, the eel's good too, like the texture and everything. Damn, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. I, I'll I'm gonna drink this afterwards. <laughs> I didn't even try the salad. The salad is amazing. Oh, really? Yeah. Dude. The salad is amazing. I completely forgot about the salad. The seaweed salad with daikon, carrots. Uh, what's, what, what type of seaweed is this one? That's wakame. Wakame. And you can that's see the That's the thin thing. one, the super thin one. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the oh. um, the one with the rib down the middle of the, the blade. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the first one. Yeah, yeah my yeah. favorite one. Yeah, that's we good. We earned it today, man. Yeah, man. We had a long day. This was a great day. Totally. It's like, totally kind of started off with a bang. Just like, those eels are huge. And then it's like, well, all right. I guess now we're just going to hang out and have fun and pick some plants and talk about kelp and stuff. Totally. Eat in the woods. <laughs> what's not to like? <laughs> yeah, oh man, I wish you guys had seen the behind the scenes. We were all over the place today. It's a lot harder to film one of these videos than you might imagine, but we were, we went to about six or seven different spots to get all the shots, get all the stuff, but it all paid off. You know, Kevin's got his channel and we were talking about doing that primitive fishing video with the abalone shell. So leave a comment if you want to see that. And you know, check out Kevin's channel. You got anything else to say? Uh, probably. I don't know. I feel like I've talked your, your audience's ears off already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you want more, Kevin, check out his channel. I'll see you guys soon. Peace.